Hi everyone, this lecture is going to cover intensity and polarization. To be more specific, I'm looking at objective three in our um, objective sheet for unit nine on waves. We are gonna start today by focusing on solving problems involving amplitude, intensity, and the inverse square law. For the second half of the lecture, we're then going to switch to focus on polarization, which are these last three bullet points here. All of this falls under the IB topic 4.3, looking at interpreting and calculating wave intensity using diagrams. So to get your brain thinking, I would like you to consider this warm-up question. Take a moment to pause the video, read through the question A, B, and C, and do your best to answer it, and unpause when you're ready to talk about it. Okay, for part A, if you imagine that you are standing on Mercury, Mercury is very close to the sun, you should have guessed that the sun would appear brighter if you were standing on Mercury. However, if you were on Neptune, which is quite far away from the sun, it would be much less bright in Neptune's sky. So the distance you are away from the source definitely affects the brightness. In part B, if you imagine Betelgeuse being, um, you know, the replacement for the sun, Betelgeuse is a much more powerful star, you could imagine that it would make the sun brighter in all of our skies. So the power of the source itself is the other aspect that affects brightness. The technical term for brightness is really intensity. And here we're talking about the intensity of light, but I want you to know that you can also talk about the intensity of sound. Sound waves, light waves, so intensity is kind of the general term. Intensity is defined as the power per unit area of a sphere at a certain distance from the source. Okay, so you can see that we have power showing up as one thing that affects intensity, and distance showing up as the other thing that's affecting intensity. A helpful equation that is not in your data booklet is that intensity is equal to power over area. Let's take a look at units. To figure out the units of intensity, I'm gonna take the units of power. Power is measured in watts and area. Area would be measured in meters squared. So the units for intensity are watts per meter squared. In fact, you could even make a substitution in for area. If you imagine, let's say, having a light bulb. The light bulb kind of being like our sun, it's a source of light. That light bulb is going to spread out its light all around it. And if you imagine taking a detector or a person and placing them at a very certain point, you can imagine the light that has spread out to the distance that your person is at. That's a really bad sphere, but I meant to draw a sphere. This distance is some r, or sometimes this is also labeled x, some distance away from the source. Again, this source could be the sun, it could be a light bulb, it could be a stereo and sending out sound waves. So we could really take this equation, I is P over A, and we could do a substitution for A, the area of a sphere, which is four pi R squared. Again, that R is the distance between the source and the observer. And that brings us to the first equation that is listed in your data booklet. I is proportional to x to the negative two. The intensity is proportional to the inverse square of distance. Note that in this equation, they used x to represent distance, same as the r that I was using before. This equation is in your data booklet. I should be careful, it's not actually an equation, it's a proportionality. 
And I just want to highlight the nature of this inverse square relationship. We have seen this relationship before in IB physics. GMM over R squared, KQQ over R squared. We've seen this come up a few times. And the important thing to remember is that the inverse square relationship between distance and intensity means that intensity drops off really quickly the farther away you go. For example, if you double your distance away from a source, you will have one fourth of the intensity. Or if you triple your distance away from the source, you get one ninth the intensity. That's not much. There's another relationship having to do with intensity that I would like to talk about. It will bring us to our second equation listed in the data booklet. This relationship is between intensity and amplitude. So we know that intensity is the power received by the detector. Now power is really energy per time. So I'm going to start this, um, our understanding of this equation by looking at energy and thinking about the energy of any wave, any simple harmonic motion, as the energy being one half kx squared. Or here I've written the maximum energy, so I'm using x naught. x naught represents the maximum displacement, which we call amplitude. So what we're seeing here is that our energy is proportional to our amplitude squared. Now also keep in mind that energy is proportional to power. We know this from the equation that power is energy over time. And that power is proportional to intensity. We know that because intensity is power that spreads out over an area. So using this chain of logic, if power is proportional to intensity, power is also proportional to energy, and energy is proportional to amplitude squared, then we can link together intensity and amplitude squared being proportional to each other. And that's what this second equation shows us, that the intensity is proportional to the amplitude squared. Okay, this is a nice quadratic relationship. So we have two important equations listed in your data booklet for intensity. The first being that intensity is proportional to the inverse square of distance. And second, that intensity is proportional to the amplitude squared. What is not listed in your data booklet is this equation, intensity is power per area. You do need to know this and knowing power per area, area can help you understand this first equation that is listed. So at this point, I want you to try a few problems. I'll leave these problems on the screen. Pause the video and try these problems and play in order to find out the answers. Okay, and here are the answers to problems one through five. A few comments on these answers. In number four, you may recognize this answer of 1,380 watts per meter squared. You might recognize this from our solar unit that you did over the summer. This is actually called the solar constant. And it comes up a lot when calculating the power that solar panels can um, produce. You might also realize in number five, number five is such a strange question. It's essentially saying, what does the power of a light bulb need to be so that when you stand three meters away from it, you can experience the same intensity that you do of the sun? And wow, that is a very powerful light bulb, 156,000 watts. A regular light bulb is like 60 watts. Okay. So this wraps up the first part of our lecture on intensity, and we are going to switch now to focus on the second portion of our lecture, which is going to be these last three bullet points in our objective on polarization. Okay, so you may be wondering, what is polarization? 
You might have already had some experience with this because you may own polarized sunglasses. Let me show you a way that you can test out if your sunglasses are indeed polarized. So if you take your pair of sunglasses and you hold it up to a screen, like your phone screen or a computer screen will work, some TVs will work. If you take that, if your sunglasses are indeed polarized, as you turn that screen, you're going to see light and then it will go completely black, okay? So you can see that in this picture here in my notes that in one orientation, all of the light gets through and the other orientation, none of the light gets through. The reason being these sunglasses are polarized. So we're gonna explore that today. Now, if at home you tried this with another pair of sunglasses that might've been a little bit cheaper, they may have been unpolarized sunglasses, in which case as you turn them or as you turn the screen, nothing would look different. You would never get to this fully black. So let's try to understand that. I'd like to remind you about an electromagnetic wave. You guys now are familiar with the electromagnetic spectrum and know that electromagnetic waves are really just a fancy way of saying light waves. All light waves are electromagnetic waves. And this picture should feel very familiar. A few things to remind you of that the electric field here listed in blue and the magnetic field here in red are always perpendicular to each other. And that both the electric and magnetic fields are then perpendicular to the direction of the wave itself. Sometimes we call this the direction of propagation. Of course, if you look individually, the electric field follows a transverse wave, as does the magnetic field. And for this reason, no medium is required, which we're thankful for because then light can travel through outer space. It doesn't need air or water or anything in order to propagate. So this is a really nice picture. It helps us see these four things, but it isn't exactly like this in reality. In reality, an electromagnetic wave is more like this, where it's oscillating in all different directions. Let's take a closer look. This electromagnetic wave, this is actually only showing the electric field oscillating because it would be so messy to try to then draw the magnetic field each time too. But you could imagine that coming along for the ride with all of this randomness is a magnetic field that is always perpendicular to the electric field and always perpendicular to the direction of the travel. You can see why we don't draw it in. It would just be too messy. And this is how regular light usually looks, where it's not just oscillating nice up and down, right and left, but it's oscillating in all directions and randomly. In fact, I want you to imagine if you were to stand kind of here and take a look down this wave, you might see a cross section that looks something like this. Again, I'm only showing the electric fields here just because it would be so messy to draw the magnetic fields too. So I'd like to highlight this direction of propagation. This is like the way that the wave is traveling. And you can see that in all of these models. That's very messy. We use a ray, essentially an arrow, a vector to show this direction of travel. But then notice that all of these possible directions for electric field exist. It's not just the nice up, down, right, left. And in fact, this light, we call this unpolarized light. So let's take a look at the differences between polarized and unpolarized. So here are some definitions that are important for our understanding. First, let's take a look at unpolarized light as opposed to polarized light. Unpolarized light, as we just saw, is when the electric field vector is oscillating in random directions. Of course, it's still perpendicular to the direction of propagation. Polarized light, though, polarized light is only oscillating in one direction still perpendicular to the direction of propagation. 
So it's almost as if the light has been filtered out. Different directions of light have been filtered out. And in fact, we call these filters, we call them Polaroids. So the definition of a Polaroid is a filter made of material that only allows one oscillation direction through. And to be super technical here, you have two types of Polaroids. The first Polaroid in a series is referred to as the polarizer. The second Polaroid in a series is referred to as an analyzer. So you can imagine we're going to start to line up these Polaroids. Let's take a look at that. Here we have unpolarized light. I know that because it's oscillating in all directions. We have our first Polaroid called the polarizer. Out we get polarized light, oscillating in just one direction. And then it's going to go through a second Polaroid known as the analyzer. Now take a look at this particular setup. We used to have light that's unpolarized in all different directions. But this polarizer, this filter, is only allowing up and down light through. So it filters out all of these other directions so that you're left with polarized light, polarized in the vertical direction. Our second Polaroid, our analyzer, is also oriented so that it has slits up and down. And those slits allow all of that, pol that polarized light to come through because those slits allow vertical light to come through. However, if we were to take this analyzer and then turn it, like turning your sunglasses, notice that I have turned my analyzer down here. Well, our story starts the same. Our, polarized, our polarizer filters out all the directions except for the up and down, and so we're left with polarized vertical light. But now our analyzer is filtering out anything that's vertical and only allowing horizontal through. Well, unfortunately, we have all vertical light in the middle here, so no light ends up getting through. And you can imagine in between this turn, it was kind of a transition at various angles where less and less and less light was getting through until it was completely dark. Now, in reality, these Polaroids, the polarizer, the analyzer, they don't have physical slits that we can see per se. I mean, imagine looking at your sunglasses. These slits are really, really small. They're so small that we often can't even see them with our eyes. So yes, we draw the slits in these pictures to kind of help us visualize what's happening, but in reality, those slits aren't like physically visible. And this should now make sense when you think about your sunglasses. If you have polarized sunglasses, if you turn your screen in one orientation, all of the light gets through. But if you turn your screen to another orientation, none of the light gets through. And so that's why using them in front of a screen, that screen is showing you polarized light, using sunglasses in front of a screen can kind of help you understand if they are polarized sunglasses or not. Okay, so we're starting to get a feel for conceptually what polarizers are doing. Let's take a look at it quantitatively. Again, you're seeing the same diagram. And even when I solve problems, sometimes I just draw this diagram out again. This diagram is super helpful. So we just learned about intensity, right? The power per area. And let's talk about the intensity of light as it's going through these different polarizers. I'm gonna label intensity in a few ways. I'm gonna call this I start, the starting intensity of my polarized light. In the middle, I'm gonna label this 
I not. Whatever intensity that light is once it goes through that polarizer. And finally, I'm going to label my last intensity, I'll just call it I. And this will be the intensity of light that makes it through not just the first polarizer, but also the analyzer. And let's take a look at how this intensity changes each time. So we're first going to focus on this arrow from our unpolarized light through the first polarizer coming out as polarized light. This first polarizer, it affects the intensity by having it. So I naught is going to be half of the starting intensity. Then that new intensity I naught is going to pass again through a pol Polaroid, this time passing through the analyzer. As it passes through the analyzer, the intensity again is going to change, but not just by half like it originally did. The new intensity, I'll call it I, referring to the intensity that you get out the other side of the analyzer, I is going to be equal to the incoming intensity, I naught, times the cosine squared of theta. And you can see up here I've drawn in theta being the angle between the incoming polarized light and the direction of my analyzer. We refer to this as Malice's Law. Malice's Law. So I want to take a moment and apply Malice's Law back to our conceptual example of sunglasses. So for our sunglasses being used next to a cell phone, I've kind of boxed off here that this portion happens inside of the cell phone itself, that your cell phone is outputting polarized light. So the story kind of picks up right here where we already have polarized light that's then going through this Polaroid. So the appropriate equation here to guide us is going to be Malice's Law. And so let's just think through this theta. Again, the theta is the angle between the polarized light coming in and the direction of that Polaroid. So for this top example, when we were seeing light coming through, it almost looked like our sunglasses weren't doing anything. Our theta would be equal to zero degrees. After all, our analyzer is straight up and down and our polarized light is straight up and down. So the angle between them would be zero. We know that the cosine of zero degrees is one. Therefore, the cosine squared of zero degrees would also just be one. This means that the intensity you get out is equal to the intensity you get in. That's why it seems like our sunglasses aren't doing anything. They're letting all of that intensity of light through. That's opposed to the bottom example. In the bottom, our theta, the angle between the polarized light and the Polaroid, is going to be 90 degrees. Take a look at our polarized light up and down and our Polaroid that's been rotated 90 degrees. In this case, cosine of 90 degrees gives us zero meaning cosine squared of 90 degrees will also give us zero, meaning the intensity that we get out is zero. It will go completely dark. We won't see any of that light coming through. I think it's really important to always return to this diagram, asking yourself, where does the story pick up? Do you have unpolarized light coming in? If so, the first thing that's going to happen to that unpolarized light as it passes through a Polaroid is it's going to be halved. The intensity will first halve. Or do you already have polarized light coming through, in which case your story picks up at this point, just like our cell phone example. In that case, we'd follow Malice's law in order to get the new intensity.
Now, we were looking at sending unpolarized light through a polarizer in order to get it polarized in a specific direction. There is another way that polarized light is created and more naturally. When unpolarized light, similar to like sunlight, sunlight comes to us as unpolarized light in all random directions. When unpolarized light hits a non-metallic surface, so it cannot be metal, only non-metallic. For example, this could be like water. Water is non-metallic. When it hits that surface, it's going to bounce off. It's going to reflect off that surface and it will become polarized, polarized parallel to the surface itself, as you can see in this diagram. So this is another way of getting to polarized light. The water, the reflection process of this non-metallic surface is kind of acting like a polarizer itself. Which brings us to some pretty cool examples. This is why your sunglasses work so well when, for example, you are at a lake or near the ocean. The sunlight comes in unpolarized. It reflects polarized horizontally or parallel to the surface. And then it gets to your eyes and you often see this glare of that light that's bouncing off. But what your sunglasses do is they are polarized so that they filter out this horizontal light, this, this light that's being reflected parallel. And so it filters out the reflected light, reducing the glare. It's kind of nice. Some other interesting examples, you could look into how 3D movies are made. They're made with circular polarization, which can be clockwise or counterclockwise. And each of those lenses is going to be um, tuned to either the clockwise or the counterclockwise in such a way that your brain will put together an image that looks three-dimensional. You might also notice on calculators, and this is only certain calculators, especially those like little cheap ones, that um, if you were to look at the numbers or like turn them sideways or look through sunglasses at the numbers on the calculator, they would disappear and reappear. That's because of a series of polarizers inside of the display. You can use polarization to actually track the aging of different materials if you were like a geologist. You can use polarization to see stresses in different materials themselves. So you can see the stress points where things are likely to break. And my favorite is a privacy screen where with your normal eyes, you can't see anything, but with specific glasses that are tuned to seeing that certain polarization, you can see what's on the screen. Pretty shady. So with that in mind, I wanna to transition to a gear up problem. You should try this problem without cheating and seeing the answers to really test your knowledge here. So this problem is gonna have a part A and part B. We're gonna do it in two parts. So at this point, I want you to pause the video and try part A to the best of your ability and then push play on the video to check your answer. Okay, part A is pretty simple. We have unpolarized light going through a polarizer. And we know that the first thing that happens as unpolarized light gets polarized for the first time, the intensity will half. So it's not even dependent on that angle. It's simply just half of the original. So I've drawn in a flat line at I naught over two. So let's take a look at part B. Again, pause the video here, try part B and push play to check your answer. Checking our answer here, we have polarized light that's going through a polarizer. So it's almost like we're going to pick up in the middle of the diagram we looked at before, which means that we're gonna to need to apply Malice's Law since we are coming in with polarized light. Malice's Law, again, can only be applied to polarized light going through a Polaroid and hopping out with potentially a new intensity according to how that Polaroid, Polaroid is oriented relative to the polarized light. 
Malice's law tells us that the new intensity is going to be equal to the original incoming intensity times the cosine squared of theta. Theta being the angle between the polarized light and the direction of the polarizer itself. So we are asked here to draw a graph of the intensity versus this theta in degrees. So we're going to try to represent a cosine squared pattern on this graph. I'm going to break it down into a few um, important points and then kind of fill in the curve from there. I know that when theta is equal to 90 degrees, that means that cosine 90 degrees I know is equal to zero. Therefore, cosine squared of 90 degrees is also equal to zero. That tells me my intensity at that point is going to be equal to zero. So I'm going to put a little dot here. I know that when theta equals zero degrees, that the cosine of zero degrees is one, meaning the cosine squared of zero degrees is still one, which gives me that my intensity is equal to the incoming intensity I not. And I can repeat this again for theta of 180 degrees, realizing that at that too would be a at um, I naught. I'll fill in this curve, trying my best to represent what a cosine squared or a squared of a cosine curve would look like. So to recap this lecture, at the very beginning we talked about intensity found that intensity was power per area, and we got two important equations or proportions out of that, that intensity is proportional to the inverse square of the distance away from the source, and that intensity is proportional to the amplitude squared, the amplitude of the source itself. You'll see a lot of proportional reasoning problems in that section, very similar to number one and number two. We then transition to polarization, realizing that most of light is unpolarized, but we could use polaroids as filters in order to kind of filter out directions of that light. Starting to represent our electromagnetic wave as something that is randomly oscillating in all directions. Here's our unpolarized diagram. And here again, looking at a Polaroid as a way of going from unpolarized to polarized light. Our first Polaroid in a series called a polarizer. Our second Polaroid in a series called an analyzer. We took a conceptual look of this with using sunglasses against a screen. And then we took a quantitative look at this by recognizing that the first thing that happens to unpolarized light when it gets polarized it halves the intensity. And that if polarized light is then sent through a polarizer, it will follow mal Malice's law in order to get the new intensity. Finally, we talked about another way of getting polarized light, polarized light being parallel to a surface that is non-metallic as it reflects off of it. Last but not least, we talked through several real-world examples of polarization. And that concludes our lecture for today.